Greetings. This is Dr. Jess Armine, and we're going to try this once again because the last time I did this, uh, there was no sound after about two minutes. So I'm going to try it again. Uh, this video is the parasite video uh, that um, I did on Facebook a few weeks ago, but the um, technical problems were so bad that not a lot of people got to get the information. So I'm taking the time to voice this and hopefully I'll make an mp4 and it'll go on the YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch it so let's hope for the best so I call this parasites the good the bad and the ugly I do want to dedicate this to dr. Andy Cutler who is a giant in autism research um, who recently passed away and uh, dr. Cutler was a pioneer a healer and a great humanitarian and uh, I like to think that um, Myself, Dr. Ben Lynch, and our other colleagues are following in his footsteps. Um, so um, the world has lost a great man, but we will carry on his work. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Ben Lynch uh, from SeekingHealth.com and SeekingHealth.org, who has allowed me to use some of his pathway planners, the genetics. I'd like to thank very profusely Eliza Lambert, uh, from Australia, who is a naturopath and herbalist, uh, who helped me with the um, the herbal portion of uh, this presentation. I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, sheep, the Soray sheep, who um, greet me every time I go to uh, UK, and they're very friendly. And I just wanted to let them know that I miss those guys. They are a lot of fun. So if you want to know about the toxic effects of parasites, mold, mycotoxins, Lyme, or anybody else, and how they get into the brain cells, you have to get into the core of the issue, which is, of course, the root causes. Now, what we're really talking about is not just parasites, not just mold, not just, we're talking about neural inflammation. And if you want to get picky, it's called chronic inflammatory response syndrome. But there are root causes that can set that up before you get the symptoms. And for those who are scientific among you, okay, I did put a few studies out to show that parasites can in fact cause neuropsychiatric problems. And um, the, first, the first article are, is about the four parasites that can cross the blood-brain barrier. The second article is about toxoplasmosis and it's linked to OCD and schizophrenia and other mental disorders. And the third article is parasitic disease and psychiatric illness. Uh, these are uh, good articles, good scientific research, and proves the fact that parasites can, in fact, cause the problems you may be having. Other things can cause neural inflammation are fungi, bacteria, actinomyces, mycobacteria, Lyme disease, and so forth. Now, remember, root causes create downstream effects. So you can't just treat the downstream effects. You can't just treat the root causes. You must treat both. So what's the main downstream effect? brain inflammation. If this is what's going on in all neuropsychiatric problems, autism, it's inflammation of the brain, inflammation of the neural tissues. The question is, what's causing it? This is also under the auspice of the chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And even Time magazine has shown that the secret killer amongst us is, in fact, inflammation. Chronic inflammation has caused cardiovascular issues, stomach issues, diabetes, metabolic disorders, adrenal fatigue, and but the number one target is the system. And this is the causation of anxiety, autism, depression, and almost anything you can see in that list can be relegated to the chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which can be caused by parasites or other microorganisms. But what's the mechanism? Okay, you see I put a little methyl groups in there, right, for the methylation. Okay, because everybody's methylation crazy these days, but I'm not really going to talk about methylation. <laughs> it is the cell danger response. And this is a paper done by Robin Navarro of the Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease Center at the University of Southern California Medical School. And I believe this to be a seminal work where Dr. Navarro has put together all the factors that can injure a cell, what that actually means, and why cells don't want to heal. First, we should know that things that can hurt a cell or activates the cell danger response. Again, they're chemical and physical. 
okay, microbial as you can see, but we tend to ignore the psychological aspect. We tend to ignore that yelling, abuse, PTSD, rape, uh, you know, sexual abuse, uh, abuse of other sorts, okay, and uh, other long-term chronic bullying, these can injure a cell just as badly as bacteria and parasites, just as badly as heavy metals, shock, radiation, and trauma. So that has to be considered. When the cell danger response happens, there's a cascade of changes. Those changes include changes in cellular electron flow, talking about the mitochondria, uh, oxygen consumption, talking about the Krebs cycle, cellular fluidity, which is cell membrane integrity, vitamin availability, and changes in metal homeostasis. In chronic cell danger responses, the thing that you tend to see is heavy metal burden without heavy metal exposure, which is very confusing to most people, but if you think about it from this point of view, the cell can't get rid of their metals. Other types of uh, metabolic reactions occur. Um, sorry, they, they uh, are interfered with, but after a little while, uh, these things just come back into line and they work again. The problem is not that. The problem is if the cell danger response persists or there's multiple ones, the whole body metabolism is affected which is then going to affect the gut microbiome, which is then going to in turn cause all the organ systems to suffer and behavioral changes occur or other changes and on and on and on and on. So believe it or not, the cell danger response is responsible for all these various diseases. And believe it, you know, this is interesting because uh, this work started with Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw in the book Life Extension in the 70s where the reactive oxygen species or free radicals were brought to light. This is a very, um, very large extension of that work. But uh, what Dr. Navarro did was show that the cell danger response, especially chronic ones, can cause things like autism, Asperger's, bipolar disease, PTSD, schizophrenia, traumatic encephalopathy, and so forth. Uh, it's kind of interesting is that it's the root of all diseases. So in chronic cell danger response, or multiple cell danger responses, there's numerous downstream effects. Those homeostatic mechanisms, those healing mechanisms that you saw on the other slide, become ineffective in the following way. The interference with those homeostatic mechanisms begin to not become additive, but to actually synergize, which is a geometric progression. And what ends up happening is those mechanisms begin to fail and your body lacks the ability to heal itself. This is why most people don't heal, right? Because what's happening is right at the cellular level. And this creates the root of all evil, which is money, right? Well, no. Inflammation. Uh, you know, we talk about inflammation and you know, doctors say, oh, you've got inflammation and they just go on to the next thing. Inflammation is the root of most diseases. And by the way, what I said about money and the root of all, Ill all evil, well, according to the Bible, it's uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, just so you know. If you look closely at this slide, and you're going to have to look real close because the printing is small, um, this organization put together everything that can happen when you have inflammation, uh, especially body-wide inflammation, like in the chronic uh, um, inflammatory response. So uh, the brain will have pro-inflammatory pro um, blah, blah, sorry pro inflammatory cytokines causing autoimmune reactions okay which can cause things like depression autism poor memory alzheimer's disease and uh, ms the skin can have uh, eczema acne psoriasis cardiovascular disease is rampant kidney disease is rampant uh, you can get osteoporosis you can have um, fatty liver or a congested liver the thyroid can have autoimmune responses the lungs can have responses like allergies and asthma. You can get leaky gut syndrome, GERD, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, and the muscles can become uh, very um, achy. Okay, and this is all from inflammation and the changes that happen therefrom. Okay, so it's really interesting. So the effects of parasites and mycotoxins, bacteria and so forth on your genetic pathways and your homeostatic physiology. This is how these things make you sick 
and how they prevent you from healing. I'm going to do a little bit of genetics now. I'm not going to get too crazy, okay, because um, that's the <laughs> whole nother lecture, okay? So here's a, um, here's a part of a pathway, okay, just to show you how um, inflammation can cause greater neural excitation. This is tryptophan. Let me see if I can get this to work. Here we go. This is tryptophan. And tryptophan becomes 5-hydroxytryptophan, which eventually becomes serotonin, which you know to be an inhibitory neurotransmitter. But these orange indicators mean that this is going to upregulate this enzyme. And when this enzyme gets upregulated, it's going to pull tryptophan out of the pathway. So what we're talking about here are all the inflammatory, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, the various things that, you know, make up inflammation, if you will, okay? And as they pull tryptophan into this pathway, okay, uh, it will become chiurinic acid, which is neuroprotective, but eventually becomes quinolinic acid, which is neurotoxic. And therefore, inflammation that you're seeing here is going to take tryptophan out of the pathway, prevent you from having serotonin or enough serotonin, and actually create more neural excitation. Interesting, huh? This is the base of the vitamin D pathway. Uh, when you finally go, your vitamin D finishes doing what it's doing and gets to the VDR, which is a receptor, it's also an enzyme, okay, the body will, this will stimulate increased insulin secretion. It'll trigger antimicrobial peptides, in other words, fight bugs. It is anti-proliferative, I actually pronounce that, uh, which is anti-cancer. It increases autophage, which is increasing the recycling of your cells. It increases calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, which are your buffers and keep your pH where it belongs. And it decreases cytokines, in other words, decreases inflammation. But in the presence of bacteria, viruses, chlamydia, Lyme, and probably other things, okay, it interferes. That's what the purple means. It interferes with the function of this enzyme. And, there, and thereby, you can get insulin resistance. You can't fight bugs as easily. You get more um, susceptible to cancer. You can't reuse your cells as like you should. Okay, your pH is going to suffer, and you're going to have increased inflammation. Now, that's that's some things on on how these um, whether they're parasites or whether they're bacteria, whether there's viruses, how they can affect the body in a way that injures it. Glutathione, which is our master antioxidant and antitoxicant, gets created in what's called the transsulfuration pathway here. If there's inflammation, and this is where you see again that purple, and particularly here I'm pointing out mycotoxins, but also HIV, and you're seeing TGF beta 1, uh, and these are, well, just think of them as inflammatory things, will interfere with this enzyme and slow down the creation of glutathione, and the effect of that is a lack of detoxification. Parasites create inflammation, as do other bugs. Inflammation is essentially increased oxidative stress. You've heard that term before, oxidative stress, and what that means is inflammation. Okay, increased oxidation will decrease mitochondrial function, which is needed for all of your healing, in the following way. Glutathione conjugation and mitochondrial function, and I'll show you the relationship, and here is the study in case anybody wants to look it up. When you create glutathione, Okay, this is glutathione, the active form. It will oxidize normally because it's fighting oxidation, and it will create oxidized glutathione, which is the GSSJ. <clears throat> there is a recycling pathway that takes the oxidized glutathione and turns it into the more active, useful glutathione. Okay, the more you do this, I'm sorry, the more that you have polymorphisms here or lack of uh, cofactors or a lot of inflammation, this pathway is not going to work very well and you're going to have a buildup of the oxidized glutathione. What that does, the oxidized glutathione, if it gets too much, it will block the entry of the electron donors, which is the beginning of your mitochondrial electron transport chain, in other words, how you get your energy. Okay, we could get really deep into it, and believe me, that's a rabbit hole you don't want to jump 
jump down. So if you just understand that inflammation and polymorphisms in these areas and lack of uh, cofactors and so forth and so on and increased oxidative stress will create a lot of oxidized glutathione and if you don't have the ability to recycle it this is going to build up and it's going to block the mitochondrial function you essentially have it down pat. The other great contributor of inflammation is leaky gut syndrome. You've heard me talk about it in practically anyone else. So very simply the gut has a mucus layer and it has cells so that all these bad boys up here can't get through. But when the barrier is broken, the immune system starts working on these bad boys that are on their way in. Okay, at first you'll see intestinal barrier dysfunction, then you'll start seeing food allergy and intolerance, and then you're going to start seeing immune system abnormalities, and which is going to lead to autoimmunity, believe it or not. Autoimmunity is not a chance occurrence, it happens from chronic inflammation. And in this particular case, we're talking about it crossing the blood-brain barrier and getting neuroautoimmunity. To support that, there was a study that was done, which you can access yourself by the National Academy of Sciences, okay, where they showed that gut bacteria, essentially leaky gut syndrome, had an effect on MS. Some people believe that uh, leaky gut syndrome can cause MS, okay, at least especially with yeast and so forth. But there is a relationship here and it's a scientific relationship that if the gut is compromised, it's going to affect the brain. And that's the takeaway on that. So parasites, how do you know if you have parasites? Well, it's a matter of suspicion. So if you have unexplained constipation, trouble falling asleep, or wake up multiple times during the night, remember there's loads of reasons for this stuff. It's when you've ruled out everything else. Unexplained skin irritation, grinding your teeth in your sleep, which is an adrenal thing. Okay, pain or aching in your muscles, fatigue, exhaustion, never feeling satisfied or full after your meals, diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia for no reason, you've traveled internationally and you had diarrhea, or you've had a history of food poisoning and your digestion simply hasn't been the same since. This is why most of the diagnosis of parasitic illness is done on history. Because once you rule everything else out and you start seeing that, well, this person went to a third world country and came back ill, and since that time, they were in a downward spiral. Well, one of the things you want to think about is parasites. The problem is the testing for it is terrible. For brain parasites, essentially headaches, changes in mental status, muscle weakness, stroke-like symptoms like aphasia, hemiparesis, coordination problems, fever chills, stiff neck, stiff neck back or shoulders. Uh, and I added in from this study things like autism, OCD, schizoaffective disorder, and personality changes. Okay, well, uh, yes, if you have acute brain parasites, it may look like a stroke, and that's one thing that has to be ruled out. But the more chronic presentations are things like autism, OCD, and so forth. And here's a really good indicator. If your symptoms get worse with the phases of the moon, especially full moon and new moon, well, guess what? You should suspect parasites. And usually when you tell that to a doctor, they laugh at you. Okay, you're telling it to your friends. They say, what are you, a werewolf? Okay, but believe it or not, I've diagnosed more, di more parasitic illness by just asking about the lunar cycles. And just pay attention to it. You'd be surprised. If everything else has failed and you can't figure out what's wrong and you get worse around the full or new, uh, full or new moon, okay, start thinking parasites. So really, when you've ruled out the impossible, whatever's left, however improbable, must be the truth. That's Sherlock Holmes. So guess what? If you're perplexed and you're lost and you've done everything and everything seems negative, even the parasitic tests are negative, have somebody take a really good history. And guess what? You might find that it might be parasites. At least it should be reconsidered or reconsidered. The testing is terrible, though. Okay, but I'm going to tell, talk about testing right now. According to the CDC, these are the things that should be done to test for parasites. Um, stool samples, okay. Uh, I will tell you that when you do stool tests, often they're negative. And the reason is, is because the parasites hold on to the walls of the intestine. And unless you're, and unless you're taking something to kill them, they're not going to drop out. Okay. Ova, which is their eggs, you're supposed to be able to see in the feces. Well, that's worse than trying to find a needle in a haystack. You're really talking about something small and occasional. Uh, endoscopy or colonoscopy, uh, sometimes you can see them on direct visualization. 
on certain types of especially brain parasites, x-rays, MRIs, CT scans, okay, can be used to see parasitic diseases. If you look up brain parasites and look for the images on Google, uh, you'll see what I'm saying. Uh, it's kind of scary, so you may not want to. Okay, uh, serology is a test used for antibodies or parasite antigens. Uh, again, this is, this is hit or miss, and often you will not see it on these tests. But uh, the CDC also recommends a blood smear, which you can actually look for the parasites, which is what I keep talking about with live blood cell analysis, but the scientific community says, well, that's not valid. Well, here's the CDC recommending it. So let me show you. This is uh, some pictures I took from some of my patients showing different parasites under my microscope. Okay, on the upper left-hand side, you're seeing uh, a parasite exiting a cell. On the right-hand side, where the arrow is and when it's green there, those dots inside the cells are intracellular parasites. On the bottom, you're seeing a white area. Uh, if you would see this while, the, while it was live, in other words, you know, well, it's like looking at a video, uh, you would have seen that, that line in there, that white line moving, okay? That's like an intracellular worm. It uh, was very hard to miss. Here are some other examples on this upper right-hand side. Uh, again, if you saw the video of it, you would see that this little guy inside the cell was actually dancing inside the cell. He was moving around pretty good. And as the cells were moving, it was obvious that he was inside that cell, not something else that the cell was just passing by. On the left-hand side, there is another indicator of parasites, as are the bottom, uh, the bottom pictures. Uh, here is uh, another indicator of what you can see on live blood cell analysis. On the right-hand side, uh, you, if you look close, you can see that one side of the cell looks thickened. Okay, that's a parasite. Okay, there's a lot of other indicators of parasites here. And what I'm pointing out on the left-hand side here with the lightning bolt is something called an L-form bacteria. And in this particular um, study, uh, the... Um, all the way here on the left, I'm pointing out some parasites. It's a little hard to see here. This is mold, uh, the one that's um, that looks like, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. And uh, the two others are other parasites. Uh, you can see this person's very, very ill with mold illness and parasitic illness. Uh, it's, um, but it was only found on live blood cell analysis. So how do you treat parasites? Okay, I mean, I can't give you exact protocols, but I can tell you generally how to treat them. Okay. First off, there are lots of foods that help get rid of parasites. Uh, things like dried oregano, black walnut, cloves, kombucha, uh, coconut, red onion, lemons, horseradish, ginger. Yeah, these are great if you put them into your lifestyle. And um, like once you get rid of parasites, it prevents them from coming back. And if you have mild parasitic illness, then it'll probably take care of it on its own. Uh, the herbal treatments include diatomaceous earth, black walnut, uh, wormwood, which is also artemisia, pomegranate, Saccharomyces boulardii, oil of oregano, colloidal silver, uh, chlorine dioxide, isatis, kawa, and I can't pronounce the bottom one. The bottom three are uh, native to New Zealand and Australia, and um, this is where Dr. Lambert uh, was able to help me uh, because I understand that these are very, very powerful and do very good with parasites. On the medication side, there are various types of medications, mebendazole, parental, um, so forth and so on. Uh, this is where uh, the actual identification of the parasite becomes important because these medications are more targeted where the herbals are more uh, global in their treatment and the identification of the parasite is not as critical. So what have we learned? We learned that parasites, viruses, yeast, and so forth can cause leaky gut syndrome, which can cause chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which can cause brain inflammation and expresses things like autism, OCD, schizophrenia, and more. So really, inflammation is the great enemy causing innumerable pathologies. And one of the causes of inflammation that is the most overlooked as a root cause are parasites. And we really should be paying more attention so I thank you very much for your time. Uh, anybody who wants to consult with me <clears throat> can contact me at uh, drjessarmine.com. Okay, I do offer a 15-minute Get Acquainted session, which you can sign up for. It's complimentary to see if uh, we can talk for a little while and see if I can help you. 
Uh, this was um, at the time, the time we we're going to ask questions, but I'm just redoing this video because there were so many technical problems last time. Um, hope to talk to you soon. I know I'm going to be doing more, uh, more uh, Facebook videos because it was a lot of fun. I just have to figure out <laughs> what went wrong with the technicalities. Okay, you all take care and don't forget ever, if nobody's told you they love you today, Dr. Jess does. Take care now.